Welcome to South Florida Saltwater Fishing. I'm Heath, and it's time to get into the bite. Dolphin in the boat. Oh my God. Woo! Mutton snapper Let's right there, this. baby. Let's do this. 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 Have you ever heard your fishing buddies or your friends talk about going out and doing what's called slow pitch jigging? Also known as slow jigging. And you wanted to get into it, but you just had no clue what it really was or how to do it or what gear you needed or what it took to just get started? Well, in this episode, I'm going to clear up some of the ambiguity and myths about slow pitch jigging so that you can get started, get out on the water, start producing with this ultra super worldwide current trend of fishing. That's right. We're going over slow pitch jigging. Before we get into this though, if you want to learn more about fishing, grow as an angler, or just see some great and exciting offshore fishing adventures, you can start by hitting the subscribe button. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell so that you won't miss a thing. Okay, we're going to start out by saying six, maybe seven years ago, nobody in America had heard of slow pitch jigging. Nobody knew what it was. Lately, however, it has taken the world by storm. It is a current super trend. So what better timing than to go over some basics and tactics and a little bit of the history. It has its roots in Japan. Years ago, credit is given to a man named Nirohiro Sato as being the forefather developer of the technique of slow jigging. In Japan, there were overfished waters from commercial fishermen, constant pressure fish not eating all the time. So this method was developed basically to entice a fish that is at rest, not feeding, to eat. This is a globally used method of fishing, which means the fish you catch are different all across the world, in Japan, in Australia, and in America, even on the East Coast and the West Coast, the same with different continents and countries. However, the basic tactics of slow pitching are the same throughout. Also, even though slow pitching has been around for several years now, it is still in its infancy. It is continuously being developed and reinvented and advancing technologically and tactically, meaning the possibilities are endless. So in our general area, being South Florida, you can catch a multitude of species while slow pitch jigging. You can catch mutton snapper, big mutton snapper. You can catch African pompano. You can catch kingfish. You can catch tuna. You can catch bonita. Oh, man, we got the hook up right there. There we go. First drop. Always epic when you get a hookup. And we got a bonita, which is awesome. I've said this before in past presentations. I had a video where I said, slow pitch is definitely one of the most effective ways to catch bonita. And uh, proof is in the pudding right there. I've said it before. Slow pitch jigging is one of the most effective ways to catch bonita when they are doing their annual run north. You can catch mahi-mahi. Catching mahi is not too common. However, slow pitch jigging covers the whole water column. And every once in a while on that wind up, you will get them. You can also catch grouper, cobia, barracuda, Every so often you will get the out of ordinary rainbow runner. Here he comes. Oh man, it looks like we got a large rainbow runner. Oh yeah. 
Rainbow runner on a slow pitch jig. You can catch Amberjack and many more. That is just the tip of the iceberg for the species that I have caught using the tactic of slow pitch jigging. So, quick little story of how I was introduced to slow pitch jigging. Was out towel fishing with a buddy in a little over 500 feet of water. Had out the Daiwa Tanacom 1000s. Uh, after a while, he asked me if I wanted to see something cool. So he broke out this setup that to me looked exactly like a bass fishing setup. And I kind of chuckled and I looked at him and I said, really? He said, wait, stop. You're gonna like this, it's cool. So he took it out and I said, oh, what, you're gonna vertical jig or something? He said, no, it's highly not a vertical jig. He says it's a jig, but it is not at all a vertical jig. Dropped it down, gave it a few pulls, and after a few moments, he actually, he hooked up and he got tilefish, nice size one, got it all the way up. I was surprised, I was like, awed. I was like, wow, I didn't realize that tilefish would eat a jig like this. So he then proceeded to offer a fair little, you know, contest. Me and the multi-hook deep drop rig versus him and his one jig slow pitch rig. And I said, sure, why not, I'll smoke you any day of the year, no problem. I'm pulling up two, three at a time. You're getting one. I straight up won the competition, outfished him, hands down. However, slow pitch jigging blew my mind at that point. He very much well kept up with me. At some points, I was afraid I was gonna get surpassed because of the speed at which he could get the hookup and bring him up. I was like, wow, okay, this really works. Needless to say, it caught my attention. I said, eh, let me give it a try. So I, I gave it a few pulls and it, it was not working out for me. I had no clue, no technique, no matter what he tried to do and how he tried to explain it to me, I was not getting it. I wasn't having it and I was still very skeptical. And so I said, eh, here you go, have your toy back. I'm good, I'm gonna go back with my uh, electric reel and keep pulling them up, you know, two at a time. After that, uh, it, it kind of gathered my attention and I did a little bit of research and I got into it. Found out a great mistake I did, which brings me to my next point. When you're going to go out and do slow pitch jigging, you can't do it for 10, 15 minutes, get nothing and be like, ah, forget it, I'm done for the day. You got to get out there and do it. Spend the whole day doing it. Spend half the day doing it. Be risky. Take nothing but your slow pitch gear out. Don't bring anything else. That way you're forced to do nothing but stick with it until you further your research and find some spots and figure out more of what it is you need to do to produce a catch. Slow pitch jigging is an art form. It's a dance, it's a balance. The jig becomes an extension of your arm. You are trying to emulate an injured bait fish, entice a fish that is at rest to feed. This is a learned skill. It's nothing that comes free. However, it is ultra addicting, and once you get into that zone, it is impossible to leave. Okay, so really quickly, I wanna go over the difference between vertical jigging and slow pitch jigging. So on paper, it looks like this. Vertical jigging is simulating a fish trying to escape. You're constantly in motion. It's a rhythm. You get into it, you're jigging constantly, speeding up the water column. Slow pitch jigging is simulating an injured fish trying to get up off the sea floor. The jig produces a twitching, jerking, fluttering motion when it's falling. Acts erratic. This is the injured look. And then you pitch and it falls. Pitch and it falls. And this a lot of times will trigger that impulse to feed on a fish that is simply at rest. It is literally that simple. Slow pitch jigging fishes the whole water column, which is how you can get this multitude of fish from amberjack to grouper to, you know, even dolphin. It's, it's a great tactic, which is why it's so addictive. You never know what you're gonna get. 
So, after my initial introduction to slow pitch jigging out while tile fishing, I said, hey, I want to get into it. So I did some research and tactics and everything, and I put a huge halt on the process as soon as I came across the gear. And I had every person and every pro and everyone touting what special gear you needed and how you were going to have to make this special tackle box and basically reinvent yourself as a fisherman to get into it. All I can say is they were wrong. So I looked at what they did. The traditional gear is basically what looks like a bass fishing rod. However, it is not. A slow pitch rod is ultra tough. It will handle the hardiest of amber jacks and sharks. It's it's known for its toughness. What it is 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 because it has this pair. It's able to have a parabolic bend from the real seat all the way to the tip. It can basically you know bend in half, no problem. And that's where the strength factor comes in. And now the reel is small. However, you're using braid. You're using polyurethane braid if possible. And it, so much you can pack a lot of this line on a tiny little reel. So I did my research and I said, no, that's that's not for me. I'm never going to do it. I would rather go and spend a thousand dollars on a setup on something else. I'd rather get a couple of reels. So I said, let me figure out how to do this without going 100% traditional. So this is what I came up with. This is my original setup for slow pitch jigging. It is a Pen Battle 5000 spinning rip. It is on a Pen Battalion 7 foot rod. Now, my guides are not acid wrapped, which means they start on the bottom and they slowly curve around and end up on top, just like a traditional slow pitch jigging rod would have, but the rod has great shock absorbency and gets that parabolic flex what I said was, is, hey, I don't want to break the bank. I'm going to go with what I got in my arsenal. I'm going to do uh, some research and figure out what I got that can work for me and somehow convert it so I can get into slow pitch jigging and figure out if it's something that I really want to do. So there's about 100 yards of underlying 12-pound test, and then there's a top shot of 300 yards of 30-pound test j break. And then my leader is about 15 feet of 40 pound fluorocarbon. And I'll go over the knots and everything to connect all this here in a little bit. But this is my original setup. Super powerful. I've taken on Amberjack, Bonita, Dolphin, many, many fish with this setup. And it does just fine. Now granted, when the fish are larger and more meaty, they take out a lot of line. They burn through the gears, so servicing the reel is ultra important. However, if you're talking about the utmost fun when it comes to sport fishing and getting a catch, this is one of the best ways to go. Don't ever let anyone look at you funny or laugh at you or give you a weird look for you saying, hey, I'm going slow pitch jigging with a spinning reel. It is most definitely possible. Okay, so after I used my spinning rig for a while and I got used to the concept and I was catching fish on a regular, snappers, bonitas, even fish I didn't even expect I would ever catch. I would sometimes catch trigger fish that were no bigger than the size of my palm. I was amazed and the hooks were in their mouth, meaning they were actually trying to eat a bait that was just as large as they were. So it, it was amazing to me. I mean. I've caught a tiny baby juvenile mutton snapper. I was, wow, it was awesome. I said, okay, I want to get more into this, yet I'm not really willing to dump 800, 1,000 bucks on a setup. So I said, okay, I'm going to look for something else and what I got. What I came up with was one of my conventional reels. This is a accurate 600N, 600 Nera from the Boss Fury series. It is on a seven foot star rod from the handcrafted series. And it has a lot of shock absorbency in it, which is what you want 
when you're slow pitch jigging. Again, you want that parabolic bend to your rod so that it can pitch and the jig can fall. Pitch and fall. That's what you're looking for in your rod. And you need a sturdy reel to be able to handle the fish. But the rod is really the extension of what you're doing with your jig. This one, I took all the line off. I had it packed with 30 pound J braid, 900 yards of it. That means there's 2,700 feet of line on here. I can go as deep as I want. If I want to go out and catch black belly rosefish in 800 feet of water or go for golden tile fish around the same depth, I can do it with this reel all day, every day. Plenty of line. If I really want to go out and try and hunt down and be unrealistic and go for a swordfish in 1,500 feet of water, I can do it. I can go try get barrel fish way out deep too. And then again, this reel is strong enough. I can go on the wrecks. I can go do anything. I can catch the big amber jack. I can drop out in 800 feet of water. If I see something down deep and I can jig it all the way up, and maybe through the water column, I'll nab me a dolphin. Maybe if I'm lucky, somewhere in the 300 foot range, hey, a wahoo will swim by. Good to go. This is my go-to rod and reel when it comes to slow pitch jigging. This is the one that I use all the time. If I'm going out, I head out, this is the first one that I grab. I don't necessarily grab the spinner unless I'm in rather shallow and using a lighter jig. I say, hey, okay, cool. I'll fuss around, I'll have some fun with the spinner. But if I'm really looking to do slow pitch jigging all day, I'm going out and I'm researching, or I've got my spots that I'm gonna go hit up first, this is what I'm using. This reel is a beast. This whole setup, like I said, that this is what I use to hunt the ocean. So we've gone over the gear. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the line you're gonna need. You're gonna need braid. You cannot do any jigging of any type effectively without braid. Braid does not stretch. It gives the jig the proper reaction underneath the pressure of water versus the shock absorbency of the rod. It makes it jig, and flutter, and act erratic the way it is supposed to, simulating either an injured bait fish or a fish trying to escape. So when it comes to choosing your braid line, you're going to need to put some thought behind it. Both of my reels have 30 pound braid. You want a thin line. You might say, oh, 30 pound braid, that's not, that's not real strong, that's not real tough. No, you're incorrect. You're not gonna break 30 pound braid unless it gets some nick in it or something happens. It's not breaking. Braid is ultra tough. I don't care if it's 10 pound test. It, it, it's super tough line. The ideal behind having to have a thinner line is the fact that to best do slow pitch jigging, you need a straight up and down presentation. So the thinner my line, the more straight up and down I will go because it will not make a belly because of any current or wind drag from my boat. So if my wind is going this way, my line will tend to bow out. So if I have a thinner line of braid, it will go more straight down. If I have a current and a wind, it will do that. When it comes to line thickness, I'm going to tell you something that might seem foreign to you. The deeper you go, the thinner you will want your line to be. It's not where you're going for the bigger fish, you need the bigger leader. You need a thinner line because of the same thing I was talking about the resistance against the current and the wind. So if you're gonna consistently be out in a thousand feet of water, 800 feet of water, slow pitch jigging, you might wanna consider going with 20 pound braid. That will keep you with a more straight up and down presentation going against the constant two to three knots of the stream. There's also what they call PE braid, which is polyurethane braid. It's actually thinner than J braid, which is what I use. It's just as equally tough, even though it is thinner. It is eight strand braid. It's ultra tough. So now that we've gone over the line in general terms, I'm going to go over the jigs. 
What I'm going to do here is I'm going to simplify the jig selection process for you. There's three types of jigs. There are jigs that are long and skinny. They call them the long jigs. Then there are jigs that are more medium width and medium thickness. And then there's the fatter jigs called fat boys by some people and uh, they're fatter and thicker. What these are for is the long jigs, the long skinny ones, they are used for high wind, high current situations. This is a long jig. And again, you can see how it will cut through the current and has very little resistance. The medium jig, which is the one I tend to use the most go-to just to try out the waters and get the feel and see what's going to happen, how it's going to react, is basically what it is. It's for medium situations, which is what you run into the bulk of the time. Some wind, some current, good to go. It's going to react. It's going to twitch. It's going to jerk. It's going to pitch the way it's supposed to under these normal conditions. This is my favorite type of jig, which is the medium jig some wind some current it's going to act properly you're going to pitch and it's going to flutter down pitch and flutter down pitch and flutter down it's going to act erratic it's going to do things that you can't even imagine it's going to pitch and go this way pitch go that way these things even if you just hold them still in the current sometimes you'll get the bite i've even been filming an episode and been rambling on about technique and all of a sudden i got the hookup every time you drop down you you never know what you're gonna get so oh, we got a hookup just now <laughs> just just from drifting out the just from drifting out the lure oh. that's the medium jig for you the fat boys are when you got no current no wind you need to somehow get that jig to react on the fall how to flutter if there's no current, no wind, and you got a uh, skinny jig, a long jig, all it's doing is going up and down, up and down. It's not doing anything. Wide, heavy, does the same sort of technique, and will flutter down and do what it's supposed to in no current situations. Again, remember, we are trying to get fish that are at rest, fish that aren't necessarily feeding, fish that have been overfished. You're providing an easy target. Fish are opportunistic, so if you provide them this easy target, chances are they will take the opportunity to feed. The fat boy, no current, no wind, you're going to use it. In deep water situations where you have current from the stream, you're going to be using a long jig. When you're in a few hundred feet, 500 feet, so even going for tile fish or on a deep wreck, you're going to, you know, you're going to be wanting to use the medium jig as a general rule. Don't confuse a slow pitch jig with a vertical jig. When you're shopping for them, make sure you don't get vertical jigs. They are not technologically designed. The center of balance is different. So just make sure the difference between slow pitch jigs and vertical jigs you have it figured out. You don't want to end up buying a bunch of vertical jigs that are diamond shaped and heavy weighted for speed jigging versus slow pitch jigging. So while we're talking about jigs, I want to mention the hooks. Typically when you set up slow pitch jig, you want four hooks. Two at the bottom, two at the top. I do want to bring up a point that there is a difference between slow pitch jig hooks and vertical jig hooks. The presentation and the thickness of the wires used and the sharpness of the hook is different. The hooks used for slow pitch jigging, which are thinner wire and have longer barbs and sharper, versus the thicker wire of a vertical jig, which is usually wrapped in heat shrink and finally when it comes to the simplification of this process of trying to decide about jigs there are bazillions of colors it's all marketing tactics to me if you're asking me personally there's two colors that work there's silver with some glow either dots or stripes and then there's red 
with some glow on it, dots or stripes. You're using the glow to get you down because you're going to a dark place and it's going to act like phosphorescence in the water. It's going to trigger the impulse to feed. Using these generalizations to get you going until you figure out further what you want to do with your slow pitch jigging adventure will be a great head start. Rainbow colors, oranges, and all sorts of other craziness, I would avoid it. I would honestly start out with some silvers and reds. And quite honestly, the silver color works hands down the best when it comes for slow pitch jigging. Now, we're going to talk about the technique of how to slow pitch jig. So, the first thing you're going to want to understand is how to hold your rod. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to get the butt of the rod up underneath your arm. Get comfortable. It's going to be a long process. Again, you don't want to be doing this for 10 or 15 minutes. Butt of your rod up underneath your armpit. Reel in your hand. This will be different if you're using a spinner. You'll be holding the spinner right where it connects to the rod, but again, the butt of the rod goes up underneath your arm. Hand on your reel, you pull up, you load your rod, pull, load the rod, give it a crank, let it down. Again, load, the jig pitches, and it falls. Sometimes when you're after the jig falls you'll see the tip do a little bit of a bounce so again one full crank so you load crank jig falls load crank jig falls load crank jig falls now you can make this different patterns you can give a half a turn in a load you can give a quarter of a turn in a load you know load quarter turn let it fall load half turn let it fall it, the choice is up to you. You can do it erratic. You can do it in a pattern. Um, you can go and make it so that you're lifting up throughout the entire water column. Or you can go only about 15 feet up off the ground and let it back down. Going for the fish that are on the bottom. The snappers, the groupers, the cobias. That sort of stuff. Or, like I said, you can fish the whole water column. Everything eats these jigs, quite literally. So again, hand on your reel, you're going to be guiding on your line, okay, pull, reel, rod will be loaded, let it fall. Again, what's going to happen is most of the time the fish strike on the fall of the jig. I want to show you an example of what happens a lot of times with that. You don't even notice that what will happen is your line will go slack as it is falling. That's when you get that hookup and on your next load you go, oh man, I got fish. It's time and time again. It's confusing because you don't know what's going on until you actually go, oh man, I got the hookup and it never gets old. That's how that, that strike happens a lot of times is your, your line will go slack and you won't know what's going on. And that's a fish. The technique of slow pitch jigging is a balance. It is a dance. It is an art form between right here all the way down your line, all the way to your jig. The more you do it, the more successful you become, the more in the zone and in tune you will get with what you are making your jig do. You will be able to feel the jig and know exactly what it is doing. On a big pull, a big sweeping pull, you'll feel it go loose and start to flutter down and bottom out. And that's where you really know you are in control of what your jig is doing. Again, it's entirely up to you. And the more you do it, the more you will become in tune with how that jig reacts. All right, 
Now that we've gone over the jigs and the gear, I want to show you how to rig up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over how to attach your leader to your brake. So I used to use the Albright knot. Lately I have switched over to what is called an Alberto knot, which is essentially a modified Albright knot. It's the same thing. It's a knotless knot. You're not tying loops and hooking them together. You're literally threading your braid onto your leader. And then your braid acts like a Chinese finger trap where it tightens and tightens the more you put reverse negative pressure on it. So we're going to go over that application right now. To do this properly, you're going to need a couple of things. I use about 15 feet of 40 pound fluorocarbon, an 80 pound solid ring, a cutting tool, a sharp knife, and we'll need our main line, which is our 30 pound braid. The first thing we're going to do is you take your fluorocarbon leader and you make a loop and you pinch the end of it. Next thing you do is you take your main line of your braid and you pull it through that loop. And you get about six to eight inches of it. Next thing we're going to do is we have sent it from the front to the back of our loop. So we will stay, we will bring our braid around the front side and we're going to wrap it up over both lines the tag and the main line of our leader we're going to wrap it around there six to eight times So this is what you have. You have your braid wrapped on here. So as you can see, we're threading the braid onto the fluorocarbon. Now we're going to wrap back down the other way, wrapping around and in between those wraps that we just made, going back towards our loop. You only have to wrap, you want to wrap about the same amount of times, keeping your wraps in between so it almost makes a cross hatch pattern. If you don't get it perfect, don't worry. Braid acts like a Chinese finger trap in this application. So, all right. Now, we are at this point. We have wrapped up and we have wrapped back. This is what we're looking at. So, we want to make one more time where you send your tag. You want it to come out the same side as you sent your line in. So we will go from the back through the front and then we're good. Now, we're simply going to pull down on our leader in both directions and tighten it up. You can pull on your tag end of your braid. And there is a streamlined finished Alberto knot. You can barely see it. It's made really to flow seamlessly through the guides of the traditional acid wrapped slow pitch rod. However, I find it very effective with any application of braid to leader because of this knot here acts. All it does is cinch tighter and tighter and tighter. And as you can see, there's no loops, nothing. And this is not coming undone, no matter how hard I pull on it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to trim up our tag end. Of our floor. 
and then we will use our knife to trim up the tag end of the braid. You want a sharp knife, that way you can do it in one seamless cut. There's our tag end, and here is our Alberto knot. No matter how hard we pull, that's not coming undone. Now the next step is to fasten our solid ring onto the end of our fluorocarbon. So, so you feed it out, you find the end of your fluoro, and you take it, you pass it through, and I fasten this with a basic clinch knot. and grab onto the ring pull that tight now we'll trim off the tag and there you have it so this is all you have that is coming from your line is your leader with a solid ring. That was how to attach the braid to your leader using the Alberto knot. And now we've got our solid ring attached to the end of our leader. Now what I'm gonna go over with you is how to build a jig. All right, in order to rig a slow pitch jig properly, you're gonna need a few things. You're gonna need your selected slow pitch jig. Two split rings. These are 100 pound class split rings. A pair of split ring pliers. Two sets of slow pitch hooks. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to put the split rings on our lure. The first thing we do is we take the split ring and we open one end of it with the split ring pliers. Now we are going to take it and we are going to fasten it onto the lure. Once you feel it bite onto your lure, you just sort of wind it on the same fashion as you would a keychain. Now we are going to install other split ring on the other end of the lure. All right, now we have split rings on both ends of the lure. Now we are going to fasten the hooks onto the split rings that we have attached to the lure. So it's the same process. You find the open end of the split ring, you pinch it open with your pliers, and you take the solid ring of the hook and you insert it. And then just like you're putting a key on a key ring, you spin the split ring around until it is completely fastened to the hook. Now that side is done, now we'll do the other side. Now your lure has hooks on both ends and you are ready to fasten it to our rod. The next step of the process is to take our lure that we have rigged up and we're going to use the top side split ring to hook to the solid ring of our leader. We find the open end of the split ring, pinch it open, take our solid ring, And now, 
your lure is fastened to your reel. You're ready. Dip it in the water, get that line all wet, and go to town and catch you some fish. So that's the basic setup in a nutshell of how to go and attach your leader, get your jig, and get set up. So after all of this, you may ask yourself, why? Why slow pitch jigging? What, what's so special about it? So there is no one answer. It's an all-encompassing answer. I can tell you, if you've ever been out, right out front here, Hillsborough Inlet, Boca, the southeast edge of the reef of Florida, go out on a Saturday, go out on a Sunday, please tell me what's happening in 150 to 300 feet. Every boat is out there, planer trolling, trying to catch kingfish, bonita, tuna, dolphin, everything that's in close. Fact of the matter is most people never head venture out past that third reef. So if you're into what everybody else is doing, you spend half the day trying to fish, the other half of the day you're bobbing and weaving trying to avoid the other anglers that are doing the exact same thing that you're doing. Slow pitch jigging gets you away from that. You're getting away from the crowd. You're going to find the fish that aren't being overfished. They're not being over pressured. You're going to trigger that impulse to feed from fish that have probably never seen a jig ever before. That's what it's about, research and development, going and finding. You're gonna spend a lot of time combing what may look like a desert, finding structure, find that structure. The fish swim around structure. That's what you're gonna do. Again, don't fish directly over structure. Don't fish upstream from it. You've got a jig with four hooks. The last thing you wanna do is hook a wreck. You're not getting your jig back. It's that simple. It's hooked on the braid and it's got four hooks in it. You hook a wreck, it's gone. Again, you're getting away from what everybody else is doing. So don't go find an inshore wreck in 80 feet and where you know, you've got dive boats and everybody else. Go offshore, 250, 300. There's wrecks that litter the coast. Find some, go do it, but again, be weary, set up your drift appropriately when you're doing this. You might wanna start down current of your wreck a little bit or start directly above it and watch it and once you pass it, again, you're fishing around structure. But part of snagging your structure is all part of it. Even if you go out deep and you're going for, you know, uh, tile fish or barrel fish or stuff, there's structure down there. It, you're gonna get hooked up, it's all part of fishing but that's not the intention at all. The intention is to get away from what everybody else is doing and slow pitch jigging is a great way to do it. So that being said, avoiding though that second to third edge of the reef is a great idea when going to do slow pitch jigging. And in closing, I understand slow pitching can be a lot to comprehend, a lot to think about and kind of cause some apprehension if you're looking to get into it, especially when it comes to the financial aspect of it. All I have to say is ignore that. Go with what you got. I did, it's worked out perfect for me for years. I have yet to purchase a traditional slow pitch setup. Go with what you got. Just get out there and start it and do it. You'll see, it's addictive. You'll see. The possibilities are endless. Once you get into that zone and you really start to figure out and hone in on technique and what fish there are out there, you'll be ready every time to say, hey, I don't know, do I wanna go slow pitch jigging today or do I wanna do trolling or something else? Hmm. You know what, I think I'm gonna go slow pitch jigging. All right, folks, that about does it for this episode. Hope you had fun. Hope you learned a little bit about how to slow pitch jig. Till next time, South Florida saltwater fishing, going wherever the cool wind takes us.